translated into English by Kosho Yamamoto, 1973 from Dermakshima's Chinese version. Chapter 22, On Pure Actions, B. Also, next, O oh Good Man. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva. Having practiced loving-kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy attains the stage of the best-loved only son. O oh good man! Why do we call this stage that of the best-loved and also only son? A father and mother, for example, greatly rejoice when they see their son in peace. The same with the Bodhisattva Mahasattva who abides in the soil Bhumi. He sees all beings just as though they were his only son. On seeing a person practicing good, he greatly rejoices. So we call this stage that of the best loved. O oh good man! As an example, a father and mother become worried in their hearts when they see their son ill. Commiseration anguish poisons their hearts, their minds cannot get away from the illness. It is thus, too, with the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, who abides in this stage. When he sees beings bound up by the illness of defilement, his heart aches. He is worried, as if over his own son. Blood comes from all the pores of his skin. That is why we call this stage that of the only son. O oh good man! A person, in his childhood, will pick up earth, dirty things, tiles, stones, old bones, and bits of wood and put them into his mouth, at which his father and mother, fearful of the harm that may ensue therefrom, take hold of the child with their left hand and take these things away from him with their right. It is the same with the Bodhisattva of this stage. He sees that all beings have not grown up to the stage of the Dharma body and that non-good is performed with body, mouth, and mind. The Bodhisattva sees this and extracts the harmful things with the hand of wisdom. He does not wish any person to repeat birth and death, receiving thereby suffering and worry. Hence, this stage is also called the Bhumi of an only son. O oh good man! When, for example, a son dies and the father and mother have to part from their son whom they love, their hearts so ache that they feel that they themselves will die too. It is the same with the Bodhisattva. When he sees an Ekantika person of the most deluded, twisted views on life falling into hell, he himself wishes to be born there, too. Why so? Because this Ekantika, as he experiences pain, may gain a moment of repentance when I speak to him of Dharma in various ways and enable him to gain a thought of good. Hence, this stage is called that of an only son. O oh good man! As an example, all a father and mother have is their only son. Asleep or awake. While walking, standing, sitting or reclining, their mind is always on their son. If any sin occurs, they give kindly advice, and the boy is thus guided not to do evil again. It is the same with the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, too. When he sees beings falling into the realms of hell, hungry ghosts, and animals, his mind is ever upon them and not away from them. He may see them doing all kinds of evil, and yet he does not become angry or punish them with evil things. Hence, this stage is called the Bhumi of an only son. Bodhisattva Kajyapa said to the Buddha, O world-honored one, what the Buddha speaks is closely guarded words. I am shallow in wisdom. How can I arrive at the meaning? If it is the case that all Bodhisattvas abide in the stage of the only son and can do all such things, why was it that the Tathagata, when born as a king, practicing the Bodhisattva way, took the life of a Brahmin of a certain place? If this stage was gained, there must be some protection. If it was not yet attained, why did he not fall into hell? If all beings are viewed as an only son, like Rahula, why did you say to Devdutta? You eat the tears and spittle of one ignorant and shameless. Why was he made to hear this and to entertain anger and enmity and evil thoughts, so as to cause blood to come out of the Buddha's body? When Devdutta had committed this evil, the Tathagata went on to prophesy, saying, Devdutta will fall into hell, where punishment will persist for a kalpa. O world-honored one! Subhuti has attained the Bhumi of space. Whenever he enters a castle and begs for food, 
he always looks at the person. If he should get any feeling of displeasure or jealousy, he ceases. Begging. Even if he is excessively hungry, he will not go and beg. Why not? This subhoodie thinks, I remember that in days gone by I gained an evil thought at a place that was a field of merit, and as a result I fell into a great hell, where I suffered from various pains. I may now not gain anything to eat all day, but even so, I will not have any ill will raised against me, so that I would have to fall into hell and suffer from various mental afflictions. He also thinks in this way, if people hate to see me standing, I shall sit all day long and not stand, if people do not like to see me sitting, I shall stand the whole day and not move. The same with walking and reclining. This subhuti thinks thus so as to protect people. How could things be otherwise with the Bodhisattva? How could a Bodhisattva who has attained the Bhumi of an only son, O Tathagata, speak thus rudely and cause people to entertain extremely heavy ill will? The Buddha said to Kajyapa, Now, you should not use such harsh words and say that the Buddha Tathagata causes any kind of worry of defilement any mental affliction due to the ashravas to arise within beings. O oh good man! The proboscis of a mosquito could sooner gain the bottom of the sea than that the Tathagata would ever occasion any worry of defilement to any being. O oh good man! The great earth could sooner turn out to be immaterial, or water become solid, fire cool, wind static, the three jewels, but nature and space impermanent, than that the Tathagata would ever occasion a cause of worry to any being. O oh good man! Even those who have committed the four heavy transgressions, or an ekantika, or those who slander wonderful dharma, could sooner attain in this present life the ten powers, the four fearlessnesses, the signs of perfection, and the minor marks of excellence than that the Tathagata would ever occasion the worry of defilement to any being. O oh good man! Even Sravakas and Pratyekabuddhas could sooner exist eternally than that the Tathagata would ever occasion the worry of defilement to any being. O oh good man! All the Bodhisattvas of the Ten Abodes could sooner commit the four grave offenses, become Ekantikas, and slander wonderful Dharma than that the Tathagata would ever give occasion for defilement worry to any being. O oh. good man! All beings could even sooner cut off the Buddha nature and the Tathagata enter the last of nirvanas than that the Tathagata would ever, even once, give occasion for the worry of defilement to any being. O oh good man! One could sooner catch hold of the wind with a rope, or crush iron with one's teeth, or destroy Mount Sumeru with a fingernail than that the Tathagata would ever occasion the worry of defilement to any being. One could sooner live with vipers, or put both hands into the mouth of a famished lion, or wash one's body with the charcoal of Katara, then ever say that the Tathagata occasions the worry of defilement to any being. O oh good man! The Tathagata truly extirpates the bond of worry of all beings and does not occasion the worry of defilement to any of them. O oh good man! You say that the Tathagata, in days gone by, killed a Brahmin. O oh good man! The Bodhisattva Mahasattva would not purposely kill an ant a large, winged black ant. How could he kill a Brahmin? The Bodhisattva always, through various means, gives unending life to beings. O oh good man! Now a person who gives food gives life. When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva practices the Dainaparamitha, he always gives beings unlimited life. O oh good man! By upholding the precept of non-harming, one gains a long life. When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva practices the Shilaparamitha, he gives all beings unlimited life. O oh good man! If one is mindful of one's speech and does not do anything wrong, one gains a long life. When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva practices the Kesantaparamita perfect patience, he always teaches beings not to give rise to any thought of enmity, to do what is straight, to refrain from what is twisted, and thus to look to one's own self and not dispute with others. And through this one is blessed with a long life. Because of this, when the Bodhisattva Mahasattva practices the Kesantaparamita, he always gives beings long life. O oh good man! If one makes effort and does good, 
one will be blessed with long life. When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva practices the Virya Parameda perfected vigor, effort, he always urges beings to do good. Having done as told, those beings are blessed with a long life. Thus, when the Bodhisattva practices the Virya Parameda, he already gives beings an immeasurably long life. When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva practices Dhyana Paramita perfected meditation, he urges beings to develop the all-equal mind. Having practiced this, beings will be blessed with long life. Hence, when the Bodhisattva practices the Dhyana Paramita, he already gives beings an immeasurably long life. O oh good man! A person who is not indolent regarding Dharma gains a long life. When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva practices, the Prajnaparamitha perfected wisdom, he urges all beings to practice all kinds of good dharmas things and is not indolent. Having thus practiced, beings in consequence gain a long life. For this reason, when the Bodhisattva practices the Prajnaparamitha, he already bestows on beings unlimited life. O oh good man! Because of this, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva does not take the lives of any being to the end. O oh good man! You asked if one could gain this Bhumi or not when one has killed a Brahmin. O oh good man! I already gained it. Out of love, I took his life. It was not done with an evil mind. O oh good man! For example, a father and mother have an only son. They love him greatly and act against the law. At that time, the father and mother, out of fear, drive one away or kill. Though they drove him away or killed him, they had no evil mind. In just the same way, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva acts likewise for reasons of protecting wonderful Dharma. Should beings slander Mahayana, he applies kindly lashings, in order to cure them. Or he may take life in order that what obtained in the past could be mended, thus seeing to it that the law Dharma could be accorded with. The Bodhisattva always thinks, how might I best make beings aspire to faith? I shall always act as is best fitted to the occasion. The Brahmin fell into Avaji hell after his death. He gained three thoughts. The first thought was, where have I come from to be born here in this way? And the realization dawned on him to the effect that he had been born there from the world of men. His second thought was, what is this place where I have now been born? The realization dawned that this was Avaji hell. The third thought then arose, through what causal concatenations have I been born here? He then came to realize that things had taken this turn because of his slandering of the Vapilya Mahayana Sutras and by his not believing, and by his being killed by the king, thus had he been born there. Thinking in this way, respect arose towards the Mahayana Vapilya Sutras. Then, after his death, he was born in the world of Tathagata Amritadram. There he lived for Kalpas. O oh good man! I thus, in days gone by, gave this person a life of Kalpas. How could it be said? That I killed him. O oh good man! There is a man who digs up the ground, mows the grass, fells trees, cuts corpses into pieces, slanders and beats people. Would this cause him to be born in hell? Bodhisattva Kajyapa said to the Buddha, O world-honored one! From what I gather from what you said, this would be a cause of hell. Why? It is as the Buddha once said to the Sravakas, O all you Bhiksas! Do not bear any ill will towards any grass or trees. Why not? Because, due to an evil mind bad thoughts, all beings fall into hell. Then the Buddha praised Bodhisattva Kajyapa, well said, well said. It is as you say. Hold fast to the precepts. O oh good man! If a person falls into hell through an evil mind, this tells us that the Bodhisattva does not have any evil mind. Why not? Because the Bodhisattva Mahasattva always pities and desires to benefit all beings, down to insects and ants. Why? Because he is versed in all causal relations and expedients. Through the power of expedience, he desires to cause beings to plant the seeds of all varieties of virtue. O oh good man! For this reason, I, at that time, 
took life as the best expedient. Yet I did not entertain any evil in my mind. O oh good man! According to the doctrine of the Brahmins, there is no karmic result even if one kills tens of wagons of ants. All such insects and animals that harm man, such as the mosquito, gadfly, flea, louse, cat, lion, tiger, wolf, and bear may be killed in an amount as great as ten wagon loads according to the Brahmins. Such beings as demons, rakshasas, kumbandas, kataputanas, and all those made and dried up devils who harm human beings may well be killed, without any evil result arising from the killing according to the Brahmins. But if one kills an evil person, karmic consequences ensue. If one kills and there is no repentance that follows, one gains life in the hell of hungry ghosts according to the Brahmins. If one repents and fasts for three days, the sin dies out and nothing remains behind. If any harm is caused to an Upathyaya teacher of the Vedas, grammar, etc., to one's father, mother, a woman, or a cow, one will have to go to hell for innumerable thousands of years according to the Brahmins. O oh good man! The Buddha and Bodhisattva see three categories of killing, which are those of the grades 1, low, 2, medium, and 3, high. Low applies to the class of insects and all kinds of animals, except for the transformation body of the Bodhisattva who may present himself as such. O oh good man! The Bodhisattva Mahasattva, through his vows and in certain circumstances, gets born as an animal. This is killing beings of the lowest class. By reason of harming life of the lowest grade, one gains life in the realms of hell, animals, or hungry ghosts and suffers from the downmost. Dukkha pain, mental or physical. Why so? Because these animals have done somewhat of good. Hence, one who harms them receives full karmic returns for his actions. This is killing of the lowest grade. The medium grade of killing concerns killing beings from the category of humans up to the class of anagamins. This is middle grade killing. As a result, one gets born in the realms of hell, animals, or hungry ghosts and fully receives the karmic consequences befitting the middle grade of suffering. This is medium grade killing. Top rank killing relates to killing. One's father or mother, an arhat, pratyekabuddha, or a bodhisattva of the last established state. This is top rank killing. In consequence of this, one falls into the greatest avici hell the most terrible of all the hells and endures the karmic consequences befitting the highest level of suffering. This is top grade killing. Oh good man! A person who kills an ekantika does not suffer from the karmic returns due to the killings of the three kinds named above. Oh good man! All those Brahmins are of the class of the Ekantika. For example, such actions as digging the ground, mowing the grass, felling trees, cutting up corpses, ill-speaking, and lashing do not call forth karmic returns. Killing an Ekantika comes within the same category. No karmic results ensue. Why not? Because no Brahmins and no five laws to begin with faith, etc. are involved here maybe, no Brahmins are concerned with the five roots of faith, vigor, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. For this reason, killing of this kind does not carry one off to hell. Oh good man! You asked why the Tathagata spoke ill of Devdutta to the effect that he was an ignorant person who gulped down spittle. You should not speak ill of this, either. Why not? It is not possible to conceive i.e. fully understand what the Buddha world honored one says. O oh good man! True words are loved in the world, or there are cases where what is contrary to the time occasion and law Buddhist teaching do not benefit a person. I never speak thus. O oh good man! There are situations in which rough, untrue, untimely, unlawful words are not loved by him who hears them, and do not bring benefit. I also do not speak such words. O oh good man! And there are times when, though the language be harsh, it is true and not false. At such a time, if this teaching gives benefit to all beings, I always speak, even if the listener is not pleased to hear my words. Why? Because the All-Buddha, 
The Arhatansamayaksam Buddha fully awakened one knows the best expedient for any given situation. Oh good man! I once passed hours in the wild, in hamlets and forests. In the forest, there was a demon called Wild. He only ate human flesh and blood, and many a being was killed. And one person from the village was eaten every day. Oh good man! I, at that time, was speaking expansively about the essence of Dharma. But he the demon was rude, evil, ignorant, and had no wisdom, and did not lend an ear to what I was saying regarding Dharma. I then transformed myself into a very powerful demon, shook his palace so mightily that there was no peace. Then that demon came out of his palace with his kindred to challenge me. On seeing me, he lost heart. Frightened, he fell to the ground, wriggled and moaned, and looked as though he were dead. Pitying him, I rubbed his body with my hand. He regained himself, sat up and said, I am glad that I have regained my body and life. This great God possesses great virtue. Being compassionate, he pardons my hateful acts. He gained a good state of mind and faith at my place in my presence. I then reassumed my body as the Tathagata and spoke to him about the various essentials of Dharma. And I made that demon receive from me the precept of non-harming. And that day there was a rich man in the village in the wilds, who was about to die. The villagers brought him to the demon. The demon, after receiving him, gave him to me. I got him and named this rich man Hand Rich Man. Then the demon said to me, O world honored one. My people and I feed on flesh and blood and thus sustain our life. I have now received this Sheila rule of moral conduct. How am I to live? I replied, From now on, I shall give orders to the Sravakas. Follow them and go to where they practice the way, and I shall make them give you things to eat. O oh good man! For this reason, I instituted for the Pixis the Sheila, you shall henceforward give food to the field demon. If there are those who, living themselves, cannot give, such are, you should know, not my disciples, but the relatives of the heavenly Mara the devil Mara's abode is in heaven. O oh good man! The Tathagata puts forth such diverse expedients so as to teach and subdue beings. It is not particularly to cause fear. O oh good man! I also beat the law protecting demon with a wooden stick. And at one time I was on top of a hill. I pushed a sheep-headed demon down the hill. Also, when in the top of a tree, I beat a monkey protecting demon, and another time I caused the treasure guarding elephant to see five lions, and made Vajradeva fear Satyakanir Grantha. And another time I thrust a needle into an arrow hair demon. Though I did all these things, there were no demons that were harmed or killed. It was only to get them to rest in peace in wonderful Dharma. Thus did I perform all such expedients. O oh good man! I did not at that time speak ill of Devdutta and did not make him feel ashamed. He, too, was not so ignorant as to gulp down another person's spittle. Nor did he fall into Avaji hell, there to suffer punishment for a Kalpa. Nor did he disrupt the peace of the Sangha or cause blood to come out of the Buddha's body. Nor did he commit the four grave offenses, nor did he slander the wonderful Dharma of the Mahayana Sutras. He is no Ikantika, no Sravaka, and no Pratyeka Buddha. O oh good man! Devdutta does not belong to the class of the world of the Sravakas or Pratyeka Buddhas. All this is only what all Buddhas can know. O oh good man! For this reason, do not reproach me and say, why should the Tathagata impeach Devdutta, speak ill of him, and make Devdutta feel ashamed. Do not doubt things that concern the world of all Buddhas. Bodhisattva Kajyapa said to the Buddha, O world-honored one. As an example, when we decoct sugar cane many times, we gain various grades of taste. The case is so with me. Following as often the words of the Buddha, we gain the various kinds of dharma. These are those dharmas of fleeing the world, of abandoning desire, of quietude, and of enlightenment. O world-honored one! Another example, 
if we burn, beat, smelt, and temper gold, it becomes all the brighter and purer, more harmonious, soft, wonderful in its color, and priceless. And later gods and men prize it highly as treasure. O world honored one! The same is the case with the Tathagata, too. If we carefully and respectfully ask questions, we arrive at the depths of the meaning. By practicing the way profoundly, one can uphold it, and innumerable beings will aspire to unexcelled enlightenment and one is looked up to and respected by humans and gods. Then the Buddha spoke in praise of Bodhisattva Kajyapa, well said, well said. O Bodhisattva Mahasattva! To benefit all beings, you put such questions of deep signification to the Tathagata. O good man! For this reason, I follow your lead and speak about the deepest depths of the Mahayana Vapilya. This is the stage of an only son of dearest love. Bodhisattva Kajyapa said to the Buddha, O world honored one! If all bodhisattvas practice the ways of loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy and attain the stage of an only son, what is the stage that one attains when one practices the mind of equanimity? The Buddha said, Well said, well said. You know well when to ask. You see what I desire to speak about and you ask. When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva practices the mind of equanimity, he attains the all void all equal stage and becomes like Subhuti. O oh good man! When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva dwells in the all-void all-equal Bhumi, he no longer sees parents, brothers, sisters, children, relatives, good. Friends of the way, enemies, those who are hostile or friendly, those who are neither friendly nor antagonistic, down to the five skandhas, the realms, the spheres, beings, and life. O oh good man! As an illustration, it is like space, in which we see no parents, brothers, wife, and children, down to beings and life. It is the same regarding all things. There can be no parents and life. Thus does the Bodhisattva Mahasattva see all things. His mind is all equal like space. Why? Because he thoroughly practices the Dharma of the void Shunyata Dot. Bodhisattva Kajyapa said to the Buddha, World honored one. What do you mean by the void? O good man. Of the void, there are such as the internal, external, internal external void, the void of created existence, the void of the uncreated, the void of beginninglessness, the void of nature, the void of non-possession, the void of Paramartha Satya, the void void, and the great void. How does the Bodhisattva Mahasattva experience the internal void? This Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditates on the void of the internal elements in Hyat Mishanyata. That is to say that the internal elements the six sense organs are void. This means to say that there are no parents, no persons with ill will or on friendly terms with one, none who is indifferent, no beings, life, eternal, bliss, self, and purity, Tathagata, Dharma, Sangha, and all good. In these internal elements, there is the Buddha nature. Yet this Buddha nature exists neither within nor without. Why not? Because the Buddha nature is eternal and experiences no change. This is what we mean when we say that the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditates on the internal elements. The same applies in the case of the external void Bayard Hashanyata, the six sense fields. No internal elements exist. It is the same with the internal external void at Hyatmabhayard Hashanyata. O oh good man! There are only the Tathagata, Dharma, and Sangha, and the Dha nature. This has no two aspects of the void. Why not? For the four are the Eternal, Bliss, Self, and the Pure. That is why we do not say that these four are void. We call this the all void of both the internal and the external. O oh good man! We say the void of created existence Samskrita Shunyata, the voidness of formed, conditioned, assembled phenomena. Whatever is created is all void. Thus there can be the internal void, the external void, the the internal external void, the void of the eternal, bliss, self, and the pure, the void of life, of beings, 
of the Tathagata, Dharma, and Sangha, and of Paramartha Satya. Of these, the Buddha nature is not anything created. Hence, the Buddha nature does not belong to the category of the void of created existence. O oh good man! How does the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditate on the void of the uncreated Asamskrita Shunyata? Those things of the category of the uncreated are all void. They are so called impermanence, suffering, the impure, the non self, the five skandhas, the realms, the spheres, life, beings, the characteristics, the created, the leakable ashravas, the internal elements, and the external elements. Of the uncreated, the four which begin with the Buddha are not the uncreated. As the nature is good itself, it is not the uncreated, as it is eternal, it is not the created. This is how the Bodhisattva meditates on the void of the uncreated. How does the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditate on the void of the beginningless Anabharagrishanyata? This Bodhisattva Mahasattva sees that birth and death are beginningless. Hence, he sees that all are void and quiet. We say void. That is to say that the eternal, bliss, self, and the pure are all void and quiet, with nothing that changes. So are life, beings, the three jewels, and the uncreated, in all of which the Bodhisattva sees the beginningless void. How does the Bodhisattva meditate on the void of nature property shunyata, emptiness of primordial matter? This Bodhisattva Mahasattva sees that the original nature of all elements is all void. These are the five skandhas, the realms, the spheres, the eternal, the non-eternal, suffering, bliss, the pure, the impure, self, and non-self. In all such things, he sees no nature of their own. This is how the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditates on the void of nature. How does the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditate on the void of non-possession? This is like speaking of a house being empty when there is no child inside. He sees here an uttermost void. There is no friendliness, no love. The ignorant say that in all directions what there is is peace, a poor man says that all is void. All such presumptions are either void or non-void. When the Bodhisattva meditates, it is as with the poor man who says that all is void. This is how the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditates on the void of non-possession. How does the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditate on Paramartha Shunyata the void of Paramartha, of ultimate reality? O oh good man! When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditates on the Paramartha, he sees that when this eye comes about, it does so from nowhere, when it dies out, it dies out to nowhere. What originally was not, now is, what was turns back to nowhere. As we look into the real nature, we see that what there is is eyelessness and masterlessness. All other things are as in the case of the eye. What is the void of the Paramartha? It is seeing that there is action and the result thereof, but no maker. Such a doctrine of voidness is the void of the Paramartha. This is how the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditates on the void of the Paramartha. How does the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditate on the void void? This void void is where the Sravakas and Pratyekabuddhas get lost. Oh good man! This is is and this is not is. This is the void void. This is this, this is not this is this. This is the void void. Oh good man! The Bodhisattva of the Ten Buma stages is only able to know a little of this, which might well be likened to the size of a dust mote. How much less must it be with others? O oh good man! Thus, the void void is not equal to the void void samadhi of the Sravakas. This is the void void which the Bodhisattva meditates upon. O oh good man! How does the Bodhisattva Mahasattva meditate on the great void? O oh good man! The great void is the prajnaparamitha perfection of wisdom. This is the great void. O oh good man! Attaining such a gate of the void, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva abides in a bhumi equal to space. O oh good man! As I now, here amongst the congregated, speak about all these kinds of void, 
Bodhisattva Mahasat was as numerous as the sands of ten Ganges are able to gain the Bhumi equal to space. O oh good man! Abiding in this Bhumi, nothing hinders the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. In anything, no clinging binds him and no anguish takes hold of his mind. Hence, we call it the Bhumi equal to space. O oh good man! As an illustration, this is as with space, which does not greedily cling to any lovable color and does not become angry with the color why Ike is displeasing. The same with the Bodhisattva Mahasattva who abides in this Bhumi. No mind of desire or anger arises towards good or bad colors. O oh good man! This is like space, which is vast and great, with nothing to equal it, taking in all things. It is the same with the Bodhisattva Mahasattva abiding in this Bhumi. It is vast and great, so that nothing can bear comparison to it, and it can indeed take in all things. For this reason, we can truly call it the Bhumi equal to space. O oh good man! When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva abides in this Bhumi, he can see and know all things. Be it actions, circumstantial factors, the nature and characteristics of things, causes, by causes, the minds of beings, the sense roots, dhyana, vehicle, good friends of the way, upholding of the precepts, or whatever is given, all is seen or known. Also, next, O oh good man, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, abiding in this Bhumi, knows and yet does not see. How does he know? According to the self fasting self abnegation doctrine, one throws one's own body into deep water, into fire, jumps from a high precipice, always stands on one leg, bears one's body and exposes it to heat, always sleeps on ashes, thorns, woven rafters mats, harmful grass, cow dung, and wears coarse hemp clothing, dung defiled woolen cloth. Left in a graveyard, cambala cloth, reindeer or deer skin, fodder clothing, such fakirs feed on vegetables, fruit, lotus roots, oil dregs, cow dung, and roots and fruits. When they go to beg food, it is only to one house. If the householder says that he has nothing to give them, they desist. Even if people later call them back, they do not look back. They do not eat salted flesh or the five varieties of the cow's products i.e. fresh milk, cream, fresh butter, clarified butter, sarpermanda. What they consume is dreg juice and hot water. They uphold Sheila's moral prohibitions vis dash avis cows, hens, dogs, and pheasants. They smear ashes over their bodies, wear their hair long, worship heaven by sacrificing and killing sheep, first saying a charm. For four months they worship fire and for seven days they partake of the wind, offer hundreds and thousands and billions of flowers to the devas, and all that they desire is to have their wishes fulfilled. He the Bodhisattva knows that all such things can never be the cause of supreme emancipation. This is knowing. What does he not see? The Bodhisattva Mahasattva sees that not. One person attains true emancipation by such acts. This is not seeing. Also, next, O oh good man. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva both sees and knows. What does he see? He sees that beings perform twisted practices and unfailingly fall into hell. This is seeing. What does he know? He knows that all beings come out of hell and gain life as a human, practice the Dana Paramitha and become perfect in the other Paramithas. He knows that these people unfailingly attain right enlightenment. This is knowing. Also, next, O oh good man. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva further sees and knows. What does he see? He sees the eternal and the non-eternal, suffering, bliss, the pure and the non-pure, the self and the non-self. This is seeing. What does he know? He knows that all Tathagatas definitely do not enter Nirvana i.e. do not truly die and desert the world. The body of the Tathagata is adamantine and indestructible. It is not one of defilement. It is also not a body that emits bad smells and decays. Thus does he know. Also, he knows that all beings possess the Buddha nature. 
This is knowing. Also, next, O oh good man. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva. Also knows that the mind of beings achieves faith. These beings seek Mahayana. He knows that they float down, or float back, or abide rightly. He knows that beings do gain the other shore. Floating down refers to common mortals, floating back refers to the Shrotapana up to the Pratyeka Buddha, right abiding refers to all Bodhisattvas, and attaining the other shore to the Tathagata, the Arhat, the Samyaksambuddha. This is knowing. What does the Bodhisattva see? He abides in the teaching of the Mahayana Great Nirvana Sutra, practices pure actions, and, with the pure heavenly Devai, sees that all beings commit evil through body, mouth, and mind and fall into the realms of hell, animals, and hungry ghosts. He sees that beings who do good die and are reborn in the worlds of heaven or humans. There are beings who move from gloom to gloom, from gloom to light, from light to gloom, and then from light to light. This is seeing. Also, next, O oh good man. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva. Also knows and sees. He sees that all beings practice the way of the body, observe Sheila morality, and practice the way of the mind, and that of wisdom. He sees that a person who does deeds replete with evil in this present life, or through greed, ill will, and ignorance, harvests karmic returns in hell. He sees a person practicing good in body, upholding Sheila, cultivating the mind, practicing the way of wisdom, and being recompensed in this life to some degree and not falling into hell. How can this action gain rewards? In the present life? This comes about when a person confesses all the evils he has done, repents, and does not commit them any more, when he repents fully, makes offerings to the three treasures, and always reproaches himself. This person, due to his good deeds, does not fall into hell, but receives in this life karmic returns such as headaches, pain in the eyes, stomach, and back, an untimely death, criticism, slander, lashings, prison, or fetters, hunger, and poverty. He knows that like karmic returns are visited upon a person in this present life. This is knowing. What? Does he see? The Bodhisattva Mahasattva sees that a certain person does not practice the way in body, shila, mind, and wisdom, and that that person performs petty bad deeds. And all such actions call forth returns in the present life. This person does not confess his petty bad deeds, does not reproach himself, does not repent, and feels no fear. Such action increases, and he receives his karmic results in hell. This is seeing. Also, there is the case where one knows but does not see. How does one know and not see? All beings know that they have the Buddha. Nature, but, overshadowed by defilements, cannot see it. This is knowing but not seeing. Also, there is the situation where one knows and sees somewhat. The Bodhisattva Mahasattvas of the Ten Bhumis know that all beings have the Buddha nature, but they cannot see it clearly. This is like on a dark night, where one cannot see clearly. Also, there is both seeing and knowing. This is the situation of the all Buddha Tathagata, where he both sees and knows. Also, there are cases in which one sees and knows, and, not seeing, one does not know. Seeing and knowing refers to what pertains in the world of letters, language, men, and women, vehicles, pots, trays, houses, castles, clothing, eating, drinking, mountains, rivers, gardens, forests, beings, and life. This is seeing and knowing. What is not seeing and not knowing? This is all the minute words of the sages themselves, and men and women, and gardens, and forests, in which these do not exist. This is not seeing and not knowing. Also, there is a situation in which one knows but does not see. One knows where to give, where to dedicate offerings, one who receives, and the fact that results accrue from the things that have been done. This is knowing. How does one not see? There are cases where one does not see what is given, the place where to dedication is made, one who is given, 
and the results of causality. This is not seeing. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva knows eight types of knowing. This is what is known by the five eyes of the Tathagata. Bodhisattva Kajyapa said to the Buddha, O world honored one, what profit does the Bodhisattva Mahasattva gain from such kinds of knowing? The Buddha said, O good man, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva gains the four unhindered Nessus Katas Rock Pratisambhita analytical knowledges, discriminations from such knowings, which are unhinderedness in, 1, Dharma Dharma Pratisambhit, 2, meaning Artha Pratisambhit, 3, language Nirukta Pratisambhit, and 4, eloquence Pratipana Pratisambhit, ready wit. In the unhindered knowledge of Dharmas, one knows all things and their names. In the unhindered knowledge of meaning, one knows all about the meaning of things of the Dharma, arriving at the meaning by the names established for them. In unhindered knowledge of language, one knows the morphological, phonological, prosodical, and oratorical aspects of words. In unhindered knowledge of eloquence, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva has no hindrance in oratory, and is unmoved. He has no fear, and it is difficult to defeat him. O oh good man! If the 